I think it's now uh, 10 hours, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Brandon Waltz, and I, I have to confess this is my first uh, Pearl meeting, even though I've been doing uh, Pearl in bioinformatics for about 20 years now. So I've uh, shame on me a bit for that. Um, so I uh, wanted to talk today about um, a Pearl framework we've come up with for doing high performance and high throughput computing. And uh, this fits in with changes a bit because I remember when I started, you know, high performance computing meant hooray, they finally approved the budget and you get a little SGI 02 to put on your desk. And now it's gone to bigger and bigger machines and compute farms. Um, I work for a, an acronym suit called EMBL EBI. And I work for a project there called Ensemble, which some of you may know about because my uh, boss, Andy Yates, often comes to these things to talk about Ensemble and what we do there. Um, to give you a very brief background on Ensemble and where this project came from and a one-slide crash course in bioinformatics, um, a lot of what we do is you can think of Ensemble in one perspective as a bit of a decompiler. So we get all this data about genomes, such as DNA and proteins, and most of this data comes as big chunks of letters, and you can go to our colleagues at the European Nucleotide Archive and download these. And unlike what Hollywood movies would have you believe, you cannot just uh, look at this and go, oh yeah, that, there's the blue eyes and there's the type A blood. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. So what we do is we kind of decompile this and we turn it into you know, pretty pictures uh, with features annotated on it. Um, and we process data that comes in from external contributors. We run a whole bunch of our own pipelines, which take this and find out what's interesting. Uh, we compare lots and lots of these long strings of sequences um, side by side. And so as we get more species and more you know, individuals in there, there's a that amount of comparison explodes. Um, so uh, we have a bit of a data explosion challenge slash problem in bioinformatics. Um, this is a famous slide that was put out by uh, the National Institutes of Health in the US. And what you're looking at is this is the cost of generating a million of those letters of uh, DNA. And the white line you're looking at is that's Moore's Law, where costs are having kind of every year and a half. And things were going fine until 2008. And then all of a sudden, uh, the bottom drops out of the cost of generating data way faster than Moore's Law. So uh, anyone who's trying to work with this data is suddenly uh, you know, running faster and faster on a treadmill that's running faster and faster to keep up. Um, so in bioinformatics, um, this is kind of what our analyses look like. And one thing I want to mention is that this framework that we've developed, it was started for bioinformatics, but we believe it's applicable to a lot of people's problems. And so your problems may look like this as well. So uh, a lot of what we have is a lot of kind of small pro uh, programs flying in close formation. Um, and you know, you have, you start off with command, pipe command, pipe command, and then eventually people write shell scripts. Um, a lot of the software that we use for analysis is not really compatible with each other in terms of input and output formats. Uh, so there's lots of blue layers put in to bunch things. Um, our data, uh, fortunately, it's pretty easy to parallelize in the sense that we can often chunk up our data in small chunks for parallel analysis. Um, the programs themselves, um, there are some tasks that can be run by MPI, a lot of other tasks. Um, the software has never been optimized or it's just doesn't, it's not minimal to sort of an MPI type of solution. Um, scalability is a big issue for us as you saw in the previous slide. Um, one of the big challenges we come across is a lot of these analyses are memory intensive. Um, 
provenance and reproducibility are really important to us um, in the sense that a lot of the work that people do, if you're going to go and publish a paper and then you, you know, first of all, you publish your paper about work you've done, you know, a year ago and you're like, oh wait, how did I do that? Um, you go through and then the reviewers are going to come back and say, well, which version of the software was you used? Which uh, version of the database download did you, did you use? So being able to go back and figure that out is really, it's really important. Um, and as many people know, um, Perl is widely used. A lot of our software is Perl. There's a lot of legacy glue and pipelines and data massaging stuff that's, that's gone along. So being able to play well with Perl is important. Um, we're running on a farm. Um, and just a very brief overview of what our NHBC farm looks like. Uh, when you have a job to run, um, you basically submit your job to a head node. The head node looks at your job, sticks it in a queue, and then assigns it to a farm of worker nodes that may be, you know, whatever, by high memory, it's the Red Hat 6, whatever you need to run. Um, scheduler assigns this job based on your priority as a user, which may be you know, literally how much money you've shipped into the farm and uh, you know, other things. Uh, resource requirements, the current load on the farm. Um, so if you can more accurately estimate your load, the better chance you can be scheduled just because the scheduler can find um, little slots to try and fit you in. Um, there's also a lot of overhead for scheduling jobs. Not a lot, it's a little bit, but it can add up if you have thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, so if you want a layer to help you schedule stuff on the farm, there are a couple things you want to keep uh, in mind. So in 2004, uh, Ensemble first released eHive to provide a better way to kind of manage these pipelines. Basically, we're replacing a lot of people just having shell scripts and submitting to the farm themselves. Um, today, so eHive is controlling 450 CPU years per year of compute time at EBI. Uh, it's actually, if you think about the amount of compute, it's more than that because a lot of our jobs end up being I.O. bound. Um, and it's not just being used at EBI. Uh, this is being used at a few institutes across Europe and the U.S. At least one commercial operation is using it, I know about, in a few uh, academic research places. Okay, so eHive, it's a framework to define pipelines, so you can write down exactly what you want to do and what order things need to go in, what's dependent on what, what resources each of your little jobs are, uh, require, and then it's also a system once you define that pipeline to actually run it so that you don't have to worry about dealing with the scheduler in the farm, um, eHive takes care of doing that best you can. So we, uh, set this up, or not really, well, it was set up with a metaphor to try and, uh, of how, how it works. So the idea is there's a central blackboard of jobs, and the job say, okay, what job is this? Um, we saw, you know, is it done? Who's working on it? Um, there's a central beekeeper process, which is, in theory, in charge of the whole thing. Um, there's we call it the tween, who's kind of the interface from the beekeeper to everything else. The tween gives birth to workers. The workers check the blackboard, see what needs to be done. They then specialize to do whatever the next job they pull off the blackboard. They find a meadow, which represents the uh, compute environment that they need to run in. Um, and meadows are located in valleys, which are roughly analogous to head nodes. A valley represents a set of compute resources that you can find. So if you look at triple the, the metaphor of beekeeper is a Perl script that the user actually runs. Uh, the tween is a module which is interface. Workers are a Perl module. The blackboard is a set of database tables. And a valley is a uh, compute farm and a meadow is a set of machines or a set of resources in that farm. Um, we use uh, pipeline configuration to write stuff down on the blackboard and get things going and define things called runnables which a worker specializes to and that tells it how to do a particular job. So this is a very small sample pipeline. Um, 
So the parts of it, you have a, you know, analysis, which describes what you want to do. Um, there are events that represent flow. So as events happen, they then trigger flow of data and work to other analyses. You can have uh, traditional in there to help direct your flow based on previous events. Um, semaphore groups, so <clears throat> you know that all these jobs need to run before you can do this one, so you put a block on these events until this clears. We have things called accumulators to help pass data and parameters around, and we can then run output once you're done into database tables or files or, or whatever. Um, all these events, so you know, their jobs, there's also parameters which are going through. We have methods for scoping, so you can limit parameters just going down one set of flow. You can have <coughs> parameters that cover your whole pipeline. Uh, just to show you, the, these, this is an example of real pipelines that are running. This is one for doing uh, comparisons of protein sequences to find uh, trees of how things are related. And they can be very big and complex. Um, so, the way you define a pipeline is uh, by writing a module that implements our hivegeneric.conf. And really what this is, is you set up a whole bunch of Perl hashes um, that give you uh, the name of it, the module, the runnable, which this particular analysis will run, um, the resource that it needs to run on, you can set um, a whole a bunch of the parameters that this needs to know, which are coming in from previous jobs or from the users. And you then set what it's going to flow into. So we have a little uh, language that goes in there, um, including conditionals. You can put any legal pro expression in this. And we have a little language. So if you use the one to A, simply means we're going to set up a semaphore group. So so down channel one, we want to check one of our parameters. We want to run these jobs. Once the jobs in this group are done, then we can clear the semaphore and move into the next job. Um, talking a little bit about how we set up analyses and events and just how that works conceptually. So you can think of an analysis as sort of a function that you present it with an event, which can, usually is a previous job has finished itself off. Uh, it could be input from the user uh, directly doing manual intervention. So you send an event to an analysis. The analysis then processes that event and says, OK, it's time for me to start creating a job, um, which is then, is from back in the day, a job goes on the blackboard and it's planned by workers. When you have an actual task, you describe it using what's called a runnable. And a uh, runnable is a class implementing our bioensemble hive process interface. And what that really gives you is a sequence of methods that will run in a particular order. So we do fetch input, run, write output, and post cleanup. And basically, you fill in whichever of those methods you need so that you can run things in, sequ in that sequence um, and the runnable will run it. Um, we receive, it receives inputs in the form of parameters. So anywhere in these methods, you can call self-param and get the parameter out by name. Um, you can do self-param required if you want to be sure a parameter is going in and you get a failure. Um, and then when the runnable's done, you can create as many events as you need by doing a data flow output where you put um, a hash that gives you the parameters and the values going in them, and then the <coughs> branch number uh, for whatever branch down the pipeline you, you want to start sending your events down. Okay, so the eHives database is a very, very simplified version of the schema, but just to show you what's going on. Um, the center is what we call analysis base, which is a list of the analyses. Um, data flow rules are those different branches and so what analysis connect to what. Resource classes are, well, the analysis know what resources do I need? Do I need a high memory node? Do I need a GPU? Do I need just a plain old local low performance node? 
Um, workers get created by the queen and the beekeeper, and so what a worker will do is it will basically find, a worker finds a job, it specializes that job, there's a role that um, maintains that relationship, and then we also have some logging going on from workers, from the beekeeper, whatever, just so you know what went right and what went wrong. Uh, there are some utilities that come along with this. So we have a uh, number of development and debugging utilities. You can run single workers, run single jobs. Uh, there's a generate graph, so the graphs I've shown you have been generated by this. Um, you can do postmortems with generate timeline. Uh, we have utilities to seed pipelines manually. We have utilities to modify a running pipeline or a pipeline that's already been set up. Uh, this is just an example of kind of the postmortems you can get from Generate Timeline, uh, or one of the diagnostics. So this shows you what jobs were running, when they were running, how many workers they ended up claiming. So you can, if you want to do some performance tuning, um, you can do that. We have a web-based tool called GUIHive, um, which you can point at your database, and it will show you the diagram. You can click on your analysis; it will actually let you. Uh, see more details, you can actually modify your pipelines if you want to, or, or do some tuning live. Um, and in the future, uh, we're looking at um, adding the ability to basically <coughs> what we call remote pipelines. So right now, this runs on pipelines that run on a single database that's talking to a single, you know, a head node that controls a particular farm. It would be nice if you have some compute resources on a different farm that you would like access to, to be able for specialized jobs to send some of your jobs over there. And so we're setting up um, an RPC mechanism to allow remote execution of, of high jobs. Uh, we're also looking at expanding the languages. Uh, we can use the five pipelines via either XML or JSON documents. Um, if you're interested in eHive, we're on GitHub, it's under the Apache license. Um, our versioning system, uh, basically anything version 2 should be compatible at least at the beekeeper level. Um, and then we have minor version updates. Um, these correspond mostly but not exactly with database schema updates. 2.4 is our current stable version. Master is the current development version, but it's pretty stable and usable. Um, the biggest thing is occasionally the database needs to be patched and upgraded as we upgrade it. Uh, anything with experimental is arguably lucky. Um, and we're supported back through 1.9 if you uh, would find the versions. And if you want to install the GUI Hive, that's <coughs> a separate repo on GitHub as well. So anyway, this is a big project. There's uh, several of us on the eHive team. And there's for the number of people in the ensemble who are users, and they also will so, you know, submit pull requests. They give us a lot of good feedback. Uh, and this is all funded by your tax dollars, American tax dollars, and some uh, charitable contributions as well. So thanks for your attention. And uh, any questions? Yeah. How does how does the system do with failure? Say you've got. Uh, you've got, you're running it across a couple of data centers and then you lose the connection or you have a power out or something like that. Do, do, do long running jobs get retried get re <coughs> midway, restarted, that yeah. kind of thing? Yes, there's a checkpointing to the extent that the jobs are logged. It's at the granularity of the job level. So the failure and the best reason for failure that it can find are logged and there are mechanisms you can go through and reset that job and pick up where you left off. Um, and we've got mechanisms in for some failures where if a certain job can't run, it will note that, but it will try to do, it can keep going down the rest of the pipelines as much as it can, while it sends you know, messages and do it on to you to say, please fix me. Yes? Um, could you say a couple of words about the schedule? Because you said that that was a difficulty. <coughs> For example, something was declared as taking n minutes, or and then it ends up taking thirty. Um, right. 
So the way scheduling works, at least we run in, in uh, LSF Farm, but this is pretty typical. Um, most uh, schedulers are run very strictly, so you, it's kind of a game of you have to estimate your requirements as close as you can without going over. So if you go over, if you say you need 16 gigs of memory and you go to 16.5 gigs, your job will be killed and you will get an error email saying sorry. Um, however, you don't want to, if you request 32 gigs for a one gig job, your job is going to sit there because the farm has to find has to find a 32 gig all on the same machine slot for you. Whereas if you have one gig, you can find little one gig slots a lot easier and get your job scheduled. So basically, the better you know your resource requirements, and uh, one thing about Hive is diagnostics <laughs> to show to try and show you this is what resources you're actually using. You can tune it very well to play that game really well and get yourself scheduled. As yeah. as that, that, sorry, that was one thing I was wondering is that whether you were keeping a running record of criminals and angels as back pressure uh, on the thing because that would be useful. Yeah, or we yeah, <coughs> keep exactly that is captain. Any job that gets killed as it goes over, that's logged and so yeah. <laughs> So I just wanted to add uh, I'm one of the developers of this uh, project. So you can actually set up an automatic uh, reaction to different events, including uh, event of uh, your job being killed. So you can say, okay, try, try my job with these parameters, with these uh, resource requirements, and if I have overstepped uh, this uh, memory and uh, the job was killed, try me with different resources. So you can set up a chain of these things. So you can you can really play very. Uh, carefully and, and uh, get your stuff done very quickly. If you first ask for one gig, uh, the jobs that failed for because of memory requirement uh, problems, they will be tried with four gigs and sixteen. So you can you can optimize it as as it goes. You don't have to stop everything and then and then yeah. do do some manual work. If you if you can expect that some of the jobs will need a lot of memory or time. Or I would have done you do it the first time in memory increasing or oh, what's up? So oh. you said you can schedule several memory units, one gig, two gig, four gig, and then the first time we're born and you see it's four gig, and the next time it will use immediately the four gig or no, no. So for each job, because uh, these things can depend on parameters. Yeah. So you flow in parameters and you get a different job. And with some parameters you may need a, a lot, and with some you, you, you may need very little. So we, we try to play by you know 80%, 20% rules. So we try to give a lot of jobs very little memory, and only the ones that need more will, will just be what we start. Sure. Oh, can you can you also schedule based on amount of data flowing to a particular uh, particular set, set of procs? Say if you've got if you're being billed but per, per, uh, for Gigabit, tra uh, the gigabit transfer or or that or um, where, where are you sending your data data to? So if you say if you've got small 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 files, lots of them, send them up to send them up to a bunch of Google Google <coughs> computer, if you've got big stuff, keep it keep it local. That's it's, it's like a, that would be a ma sort of manually set up analyses to do that that are going to do your file transfer. Um, if you're trying to to batch those, that's not really built in to Hive. Um, that yeah, that would be more. You would design your own jobs and say we need to do a batch transfer here. Yeah. What, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is if you if you've got a shared load box, a load of storage in the data center, but you also need to burst and expand, burst for a quick job, and you fire up a load of, load of stuff um, in the cloud. You've got to, you've got to get a load of data up there, and it, depending depending. On whether, whether, whether the job job is defined right, you can end up with um, you can end up running a very running very big bill because of data because of uh, back and bandwidth usage and data transfer. That's right. that, it's, it's basically managing the money more than anything else. Yeah, it's not. It's, I think we we'll, we we'll have to yeah. yeah. I yeah. Have to have people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because we have our own farms, mm. and we don't need to pay for. 
with data transfer, we have everything on site. Sure. Um, but we, we have been discussing the possibility of running this the same code basically on Amazon Cloud. Yeah. And then we would need to think about, yes. Uh, That's where it gets hairy or yeah. expensive. <laughs> Yeah. Other questions? Uh, can can you define cyclic jobs? Um, you can yeah you can have a job that oh, the job that runs once it's completed it restarts and runs for a number of cycles or the job that uh, is running each five minutes and checks something. Yes, uh, the only thing I would I would suggest that you change the parameter at least make some kind of virtual parameter that would be increasingly needed because then you would have you would be able to control all iterations of the Otherwise as as you have been discussed with this checkpoint you think if everything crashes you you don't know which iteration to use. You can flow into itself. Every iteration.